Is it entirely necessary for us to rank 31 rookie receivers for Dynasty PPR drafts this summer? Probably not, but we're going to do it anyway. Yeah, it's a lot of names today. More so than the running backs even, and the running back episode was like an hour long. So this is probably going to be even longer. Not that anybody's complaining about that. Uh, if you'll remember from last episode, again, these rankings are in Excel format over on the Patreon. They've been there for like a week, a week and a half at this point by the time this comes out. So if you are doing a dynasty draft this summer and you want uh, everything that I talk about today in document form, it's available for all tiers over on the Patreon. And also a quick reminder, there is a $5 tier over on the Patreon now that gets you access to the patron only section of our Discord server, uh, which I happen to hang out in every single day. So it's a lot easier to have conversations with you guys in that part of the Discord than in the main part of the Discord where there's like a lot of people. So <laughs> if you wanna join the patron only part of the Discord, that's over at the link in the description below. But with that being said, we have a shitload of receivers to talk about today. I'm not gonna waste any more of your time. Let's get to tier one. It's no secret that I've been a Zay Flowers truther from the very beginning of this draft cycle. I've had him as my wide receiver 1A for, I think actually the entire time. Like even going back to January when I first saw him at the Shrine Bowl, I immediately fell in love. He is arguably the most versatile receiver in this class in the sense that we could put him at X and he's gonna break press coverage with ease because he's got great feet, a really refined release package, and obviously the speed to get over the top. We can even put him at Z because he still has the burst even with that added space between him and the corner to still get over the top of those corners deep as well. And I think that as a Z, you kind of need to have unreal quickness and burst in that first 10 to 15 yard area or you're just not going to win deep. And he has that. And we also could put him in the slot, obviously, because he's really quick laterally and he's such a good and refined route runner and really tough over the middle. So all the typical slot receiver stuff he can do with ease. And I just think the fact that he is a multi-level threat from every single receiver position on the field in every single offense you can think of, it just kind of makes him scheme proof. He's somebody who's gonna be a good football player probably no matter what. Like there's not really any real weaknesses here other than size, obviously. But even then he put on 13 pounds in the off season leading up to the combine and still ran in the low four fours. He was a four three guy at BC when he was at his previous size. Now he's like four four one, which is still pretty crazy fast. The fact that we can give him carries as the quote unquote jet sweep guy from the slot, we can throw him screens, he's a mid-level threat, and he's a legitimate deep threat as well from anywhere on the field. There's just very few receivers in this class that I can say that about, and Zay Flowers by far is the best one. As for his role as a rookie in Baltimore, I have to imagine that most of his snaps are going to be in the slot this year, just because they have Odell and Rashad Bateman, and I think Odell's probably going to be the X receiver and Bateman's probably going to be the Z. Maybe they flip Flowers and Bateman and have Bateman be the slot, but at least in terms of how I see it right now, I think Flowers is going to be the primary slot receiver, especially because of how deadly he can be on jet sweeps and screens and all that kind of stuff. And then eventually, you know, maybe in two or three years, depending on what happens with Odell long term and what happens with uh, Rashad Bateman's plans with the organization, how those kind of develop, maybe he eventually turns into legitimately the wide receiver one there. We don't know. Either way, he's at least going to be a heavy contributor in the slot with potential wide receiver two or wide receiver one upside based on the durability of Odell and Bateman in front of him, who historically have had some durability issues. So I really do think that in terms of floor, the floor is really high for flowers. And in terms of ceiling, it's absolutely astronomical. That is why, to me, he's the safest bet in this receiver class in terms of dynasty potential. Also, it helps that he's playing with an MVP caliber quarterback and ideally a much better offensive play caller in Todd Monken too. But hey, who's counting? I also have similar feelings about JSN to Seattle. And keep in mind before I get into JSN, this is not really like a, a, an absolute wide receiver two versus wide receiver one discussion. Just like in the real draft, I see Flowers and JSN as like a 1A, 1B type thing. So if you believe strongly in JSN and you wanna take him over Flowers, believe me, I understand it. There actually is an argument for that. For me personally though, I see Flowers as the higher ceiling option just because I think he could legitimately be the wide receiver one in Baltimore one day, whereas JSN, 
as long as DK Metcalf's there and as long as Tyler Lockett's still doing his thing, I don't really ever think that he's going to be the wide receiver one for Geno Smith or whoever happens to be quarterback in the Seahawks in the future. I also think from a physical standpoint, I think Flowers has a higher ceiling of production because he is a true three-level threat. And even though JSN, his short area burst to stack on corners initially is really, really special, like that 10 to 12 yard burst, I don't really see him having that extra third gear to pull away from people deep down the field to be a true deep threat, like say Flowers can. I think that in terms of the intermediate and the short area of the field, that's where JSN's really gonna dominate, especially over the middle. I mean, he's got vice grips for hands, he's super tough, he has yards after catch ability, he's a great route runner. Pretty much everything from that like 17, 18 yard shelf and under, he will be really, really good. It's just that extra level on top of that that makes DK Metcalf DK Metcalf or makes Lockett Lockett. I, I don't quite see that with him. Doesn't mean he's not a great player. He absolutely is a great player, but I think there's a little bit of a cap on the ceiling compared to Flowers where say the floor might be a little bit higher. So really it's about what you prefer. Right. You know, if you're drafting for floor and you just want somebody who's going to be a consistent contributor in the slot, somebody who in any given year as his career goes on could get 80 catches for like a thousand to eleven hundred yards, even if the potential for 14 or fifteen hundred isn't there. If you just want that floor and that consistency, JSN is going to be your guy. Whereas with Flowers, like I said, you know, depending on what happens with Odell in the future and what happens with Bateman in the future, he could be legitimately the wide receiver one in Baltimore for an MVP caliber quarterback and put up those types of numbers. So it just kind of depends on what you're looking for here. Do you want immediate production and floor or do you want long term ceiling? I don't fault you either way. You just have to be aware of what types of roles these guys are going to play and how that might affect their long term potential production. Now, looking at the names that I have coming up in tier two, there are some really, really talented guys in this group. Some would say that they are just as, if not even more naturally talented than the guys that I have in tier one. And that's totally fair. Like I think their ceilings are monstrously high. And even looking at ADPs, like if you're gonna go on underdog right now and you're doing like best ball mania four drafts, right? Cause it's best ball season. Everybody's trying to get a share of that $15 million prize pool. There's a lot of money on the table. So everybody's trying to draft now so they can get all these rookie values. If you're doing those drafts right now, Jordan Addison's ADP is 72.8 as of the day of me recording this. Quentin Johnston's ADP is 88. Zay Flowers is actually going behind them at 93.1. So there is some debate in terms of ceiling and floor among this rookie class. And I would not fault anybody for taking some of these tier two guys, especially for 2023, over Zay Flowers in tier one. That being said, we're talking about dynasty here, which is a little bit different than best ball. Actually, a lot of it different than best ball. We're trying to project entire careers here. So I think that there is some nuance to this and you have to recognize that different formats prioritize different things. And I won't fault you at all for taking, you know, at least one, maybe two of the tier two guys ahead of who I have in tier one. I would totally understand why. I just happen to have a preference for Flowers and JSN. But that being said, again, tier two, full of extraordinarily talented receivers in their own right. And I think that all of them at least warrant that type of discussion. So with all that out of the way, let's get to tier two. Starting off with Jordan Addison here to lead off tier two, it's pretty easy to fall in love with the landing spot in Minnesota and project him as a very high floor rookie. Obviously, KJ Osborne is still there, but I have to imagine that Minnesota is going to spend most of their time in 11 personnel anyway, so Addison's going to be on the field no matter what. And the fact that he can be either a slot assassin or you can put him at Z and use him as a legitimate deep threat means that you can kind of move him around just to give him whatever the best matchup from week to week actually is. Obviously, Jefferson is going to be playing the X receiver role 95% of the time, so it's not like Addison has to be on the line of scrimmage that much anyway, which is probably best for him. Addison does have a pretty slight frame, so I do have some concerns about durability if they make him a full-time slot receiver, because if he's working the middle of the field and he's at somewhere in the ballpark of 170 pounds, you know, maybe up to 175, I do get a little bit sketched out by that. I want him to add a bit more body armor so that he can take that punishment from NFL linebackers, but it's not like he's Tank Dell. Tank Dell was 166. He, I genuinely do have like medical concerns about if he took the wrong hit over the middle. He's, he's really small. 
Addison at least has a little bit more weight than him, but I want to see him add more. In terms of what he does bring to the table, he's a phenomenal route runner. He's a great yak threat. I already mentioned his deep ball ability, like his ability to track a deep ball over his shoulder is really special. And that's a very underrated skill set, by the way, because a lot of receivers, even if they have, you know, 4-3, low 4-4 speed, if they can't track the trajectory and angle of a deep ball, they're not going to catch it anyway, even if they are open. Whereas Addison, again, he's so good at ball tracking that even though he's not the fastest receiver, he still does have speed, but he's not like a legit Deshaun Jackson type burner, right? But the fact that he tracks the deep ball so well means that he's actually a more effective deep ball receiver than a lot of guys who are faster than him. Overall, I do think he's going to make his living as kind of a movable chess piece in this offense. Sometimes he'll be outside, sometimes he'll be inside. And as long as he holds up and he remains durable and hopefully he can go from 173 up to like 178, 179, just add five, six more pounds, get in the ballpark of 180. I'll feel a lot better about his long-term prospects if he can do that. And I think he can. Now, from there, we're going to go to Quentin Johnston, who absolutely has no size concerns. He's a big receiver at about 6'2", 210, but he also has a very weird profile. Not weird as in bad, more so just weird as in I don't think I've ever seen it before in terms of having a bigger body receiver that you think should be a jump ball dominator, but he's more of a yak threat. When looking at the stat of all stats for determining who's the best with the ball in their hands in space, somebody who's really good at breaking tackles and burning angles and all that kind of stuff, we look at yards after catch per reception. And when looking at the yak per reception of all the top receivers in this class, whether it's Johnston or Addison or even the tier one guys like Zay Flowers and JSN or Jonathan Mingo or Jalen Hyatt, you know, Marvin Mims, any of these top receivers or rather top 12 to 15 receivers. Quentin Johnston by far has the highest yak per reception in this class. It's not even close. He's at 8.7 and the second ranked receiver is a full yard behind him at 7.7. .7. That's Marvin Mims. And that 8.7 number, by the way, is more than double what the Chargers receivers averaged last year. The Chargers receiving core, which I know was banged up, but still, they were 17th in the NFL in terms of average yak per reception. They were at 4.2. Again, Johnston is at 8.7, so every time he gets the ball in his hands, he is averaging nearly a full first down just in yards after the catch. I understand that there are a lot of warts to his game. I don't necessarily think that he's got great contested catch skills. He does tend to body catch a lot of balls, which kind of annoys me. His private wide receiver coach insists that it's more of an eye discipline issue than anything else and that it's fixable, so we'll see. Again, I trust the coaches and obviously the Chargers front office trust their coaches as well. They think they can fix his hands. And if they do fix his hands, he's going to be absolutely fucking unstoppable. Believe you me, he will be the best receiver in this class if they fix his hands. But even just as is right now, he is so special as a yak threat with the ball in his hands that if they're just giving him screens, if they're giving him hitches and curls, you know, shallow crosses, all that kind of stuff, Anything within, you know, seven to eight yards of the line of scrimmage where we just get him the ball and say, go win, he's going to go win. Quentin Johnston is special in space. And again, I know this is a very weird profile because you don't expect somebody with his size to be primarily a yak threat early in their career, but he is, and he's really damn good at it. We're coming back on camera for our next two names here. It's going to be Jalen Hyatt and Jonathan Mingo because as you all know, I can't show SEC film anymore. Apparently the coaches at Tennessee think that, uh, you know, if anybody sees all 22 of them running deep choice, somebody's gonna magically figure that shit out. Like it hasn't been run for 15 years. It's not fucking rocket science, guys. Like it's deep choice, calm down. Everybody knows how it works. Me showing all 22 of your players playing well isn't gonna suddenly make you a bad team. If that's the difference, by the way, between Tennessee winning and losing is a YouTuber showing all 22 clips of them running deep fucking choice 15 times a game, that's bad for you. But anyway, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. Let's talk about Jalen Hyatt and his skill set. Fucking Tennessee. Anyway, um, so Jalen Hyatt, very fast, very explosive. My hang up with him when I was kind of ranking him pre-draft was I didn't really know how that Tennessee system was going to translate to the NFL. Because again, 
they run deep choice a lot. Like they they basically made an entire offense out of side dishes rather than entrees. And it works at the college level, right? Because the hashes are so wide. There's so much space and they were able to do things in terms of how they lined up their receivers in like double stacks and stuff like that, where, you know, Jalen Hyatt just never saw press coverage ever. He was able to get free releases and he's so freaking fast and there's so much space because the hashes, again, are way wider in college that there's just too much grass to cover when somebody runs, you know, legit 4-3, low 4-4 speed. And when you have an arm talent like Hendon Hooker, who is just reading leverage of the DB, 30 yards down the field and the receiver's just going to run to wherever the DB isn't. Anyway, if I give too much away, Tennessee's going to come after me. It's fucking deep choice, guys. There's literally a clinic on how it works on YouTube. I am not the problem. Anyway, sorry, sorry, getting on a tangent. It was tough for me to figure out how that system translates to the NFL because the NFL just doesn't run Tennessee's offense. And we didn't see that many reps of Hyatt against press coverage, so we didn't really know how he was going to handle it in the NFL. But about a week before the draft, I looked at every snap that he did take against press coverage. There's like 36 of them total. And he actually beat it pretty consistently. Again, super small sample size. Fully recognize that. But he was a lot more physical against press than a lot of the other speed receivers in this class. Uh, like Tyler Scott, who I'm going to go over in a little while, just got beat up by Temple. They pressed him all game and he couldn't get off of it. Whereas Jalen Hyatt, he, you know, again, not very many snaps, but he was going up against all these SEC DBs that when they did get an opportunity to jam him, he was really physical in terms of kind of ripping through and still getting a stack position on top of the DB and getting over the top. So in the limited sample that we saw, I was like, okay, there's something there. You know, he does have good ball skills, especially deep down the field. He's phenomenal at tracking the deep ball. Everybody knows about his speed, but, you know, it also works for catch and run opportunities as well. Like if you get him on a shallow cross and there's nobody in front of him, he's gone. And so looking at how that skill set translates to the Giants offense, I think that Brian Dable is, again, going to use him as like a Z receiver that they can kind of move around and give free releases and keep him off of press coverage because he's going to be, you know, a couple yards off the line of scrimmage. And you use that speed to your advantage laterally, not just vertically. If we're looking at how Brian Dable offenses have functioned in the past, one of their favorite calls against man coverage is not 989. You know, it's not, hey, we have press man outside on both sides. Let's throw up a jump ball. They call spear. Like, you know, you have you have these two crossing routes that go deep. Some coaches call it deep mesh. Uh, you know, Bama had a version of it that they called wave, but you get these crossing routes deep down the field that both cross in front of a free safety and a middle field close look, and the free safety has to choose one or the other, and the other corner is kind of just screwed, right? Because they're, they're deleveraged is a term that some wide receiver coaches use uh, against man coverage when, when the guy's running a deep cross. They don't have any help, and you have a guy who's running 4-3 that is just has a bunch of green grass in front of him. And I think Brian Dable is going to do that a lot with Jalen Hyatt. In Buffalo, he did it with Stephon Diggs. Uh, he tried to do it a little bit last year with Wandale Robinson, but I think Wandale is just not as physical as Hyatt. So I think Hyatt it probably suits him a little bit better. But, you know, in terms of having that speed threat that you're exploiting laterally, not just vertically, that is a role that Dable really, really wants to fill in this offense. And I think that Hyatt's the guy for it. And that's going to benefit Daniel Jones a lot as well, because he does have a really nice deep ball. I have been extremely critical of DJ for pretty much his entire career. And a lot of it was warranted. But that being said, the pick of Jalen Hyatt by the Giants single-handedly changes my optimism and outlook for his entire career, because this is the type of weapon that I think can unlock this system and therefore unlock Daniel Jones. You know, they have made significant improvements to the offensive line over the last couple of years. Obviously, Andrew Thomas is one of the best left tackles in the league. After kind of a rough start in his rookie year, he's really grown and developed. We have high hopes for Evan Neal, and they took my favorite interior lineman in this class and John Michael Schmitz in the second round. So when you're looking at Saquon plus an improved offensive line, you know, plus Waller, plus a receiving core that isn't isn't that bad anymore. Like, I think they're OK there. And you throw Hyatt into the mix like Daniel Jones is somebody who I'm actually kind of excited about in 2023, which is not what I expected. But I, I think he's got a good shot to have a great year this year. And Hyatt's a big a big piece for that. So 
I really do believe in Jalen Hyatt long term with the Giants because he's going to play a critical role in this offense. And it's not like Brian Dable's going anywhere. So as long as he's there and as long as you have a good deep ball thrower in DJ, Jalen Hyatt will have a role. And he's somebody that I am absolutely interested in investing in early when it comes to the dynasty format. From there, we're going to go to Jonathan Mingo. Again, another SEC receiver, so I can't show film. But I do want to talk about his role in this Carolina offense, not just in 2023, but also 2024 and going forward because he really is more of an investment in 2024 and onward uh, for me right now I don't really see a big role for him in 2023 because you got Terrace Marshall there who's you know still a very talented uh, prospect he's young enough I could still call him a prospect but he's got legitimate outside receiver ability I just feel like the structure around him has not been there as of yet to display that I was very high on him coming out of LSU. I still have hopes for that. Uh, DJ Chark, speaking of LSU receivers, also another outside guy with vertical explosiveness. And then you got Adam Thielen manning that slot role. So I don't really see where Mingo's getting on the field a lot for this year, unless somebody gets hurt. And I just think that for the role that he's going to play, there's just not a lot of snaps to go around right now. And so this is really more of an investment for the future. And I'm okay with that because he does have legitimate wide receiver one ability to me. I think some people maybe get trapped with the comparison to AJ Brown and DK Metcalf, because again, it's the same school. He's 220 pounds, also has like low 4-4 speed, which those guys did too. And so some people automatically just say, oh, he's DK and he's AJ and he's going to be great. He's not there yet. You know, even DK Metcalf, who had the quote unquote raw label coming out of Ole Miss, he was really developed at the three routes that they asked him to run. And then he, again, became very developed at a full route tree over the next two years in his NFL career. But he was a good route runner. And A.J. Brown was a phenomenal route runner himself, even though he was more of an inside guy at Ole Miss. But again, good route runner. And so I think that, you know, looking at Jonathan Mingo, who is not as developed as those guys yet, it doesn't mean he won't be. Uh, but he's not as developed as those guys yet. And I do think that he kind of needs some seasoning as a backup right now so that he can learn how to break press coverage. He was a little bit inconsistent at that to me. I think that his release package overall could stand to expand a little bit because you could really tell what he was going to do based on where his toes were pointed and how wide his feet were. Uh, he was a little bit easier to read for an NFL caliber DB. Obviously, SEC DBs or college kids in general you know, might not pick up on some of the things that he was doing, but NFL DBs absolutely would. So I think he needs to kind of expand his release package. You know, he's just, I don't want to use the term raw, like he's not raw, but there are just a lot of things he needs to clean up before he can get to that DK Metcalf, AJ Brown level. He has the talent. He absolutely could be a wide receiver one. And to be honest, by the end of his rookie year, he could have all that shit cleaned up and be just fine and challenge for a starting role. But again, we think he's going to be a backup as a rookie. This is an investment in the future. It's an investment in his talent. And it's an investment in the coaching staff that we think they're going to get the little stuff cleaned up so that he can maximize his physical gifts. And he is extraordinarily gifted. That's why I have him in tier two. But I just don't expect a whole lot from him this season. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, rounding off tier two, we have somebody who I think will probably have a pretty big impact role as a rookie as well as in 2024 and beyond, hence why I love him in Dynasty. And that's going to be Josh Downs. We talked about weird profiles earlier with Quentin Johnston, where he was a big receiver with a 40-inch vert that somehow wasn't a contested catcher and was more of a yak threat. Well, Josh Downs is kind of the opposite. He's a smaller receiver at about 5'9", 170, who just so happens to be one of the best contested catchers in this class anyway. Even though he isn't that big, in fact, he's smaller than Jordan Addison even, he has a 70% contested catch percentage, which is absolutely insane. Keep in mind that for context, a lot of the best jump ball receivers or true number ones that we think of in the NFL that can win on jump balls, they typically average somewhere around like 55% contested catch percentage. The fact that Josh Downs is 15% above that and he's only 5'9", 170, it kind of just doesn't make sense, but he just plays so far above his weight class and his ball skills are so good and he's so tough and so physical that, you know, size be damned. He just makes it work. Throw in the fact that he has legitimate deep speed, not amazing deep speed, but it is legit. It's like mid to high 4-4 and he has incredible short area quickness that kind of naturally lends himself to being more of a slot receiver. 
and you have somebody with a very intriguing and unique profile that I think could potentially develop into an every week starter when it comes to fantasy football. A lot of prototypical slot guys that we think of, you know, that are around Josh down size, we see them as like PPR assets because, oh, they'll get fed the ball, they'll get seven catches that'll all go for five yards and we're only getting points off of the catches, less so about the yards. But again, with Downs, the fact that he is an actual deep threat and he's a red zone threat too because you can run slot fades with him and he'll go win, that kind of elevates him over a lot of other, again, classic, smaller, quicker slot receivers that don't really have that jump ball skill set or even that deep ball skill set. This is not a Julian Edelman type of player who's going to do most of his work within the first 15 yards past the line of scrimmage. The fact that he can do his work outside the numbers and deep down the field, it just raises his overall ceiling to a level that honestly might even exceed a lot of the other guys that are ranked above him. Not to mention, I think he went to an absolutely fantastic situation in Indianapolis where he has a young quarterback that can feed him the ball deep down the field and will also feed him the ball in the red zone because Anthony Richardson, as far as throwing fade balls, I think he's way underrated in that regard and he's a lot better at it than people give him credit for. I just feel like the skill sets very much sync up here and I think that if we are going to draft a quote unquote small slot receiver for Anthony Richardson, Josh Downs is the one that actually fits him because you can use him in every area of the field. His height and weight are listed as small, but he does not play small. And that is really what matters. One quick note on Josh Downs, by the way, we just had our draft in kind of like an industry dynasty league that I'm in with a whole bunch of other people from various areas of general football media, whether it's NFL media, ESPN, PFF, uh, Pro Football Network, Kyle Yates runs the league. Um, you know, the ringer, a whole bunch of people that you probably also follow are in this league. And we just had our draft and Adam Rink, beloved Bears fan. Everybody loves Adam. He had the first overall pick and also the first pick in the second round, too. And our boy, Adam, wonderful Adam, sweet, innocent Adam was on auto draft and he was lucky. He auto drafted Bijan Robinson and then he auto drafted Josh Downs at the top of the second round and he wanted Roshan Johnson. I got Roshan Johnson. I took him at the sixth pick in the second round. You all know he's my dynasty RB2 this year. I'm flying high. I'm feeling great. And this man had the audacity after the draft was over to send me a straight up trade offer of Josh Downs for Roshan Johnson. Adam, if you ever see this, you will get Roshan when you pry him from my cold dead hands. You will never get him. I already have Justin Fields. I have Khalil Herbert. I've got Roshan now. I'm going for the Bears Infinity Gauntlet, bro. I'm going for DJ Moore. Give me Darnell Mooney. I want all of them. You will get nothing. Unless you give me Bijan, then we'll talk. Now that I think about it, if I really want Caleb Williams next year, I just have to ransom as many Bears players as I can to Adam, and he'll probably give me whatever I want, including his first round picks. I think I'm going to do that. But anyway, uh, trade schemes aside, let's get to tier three. Looking at this tier overall, we have some really, really high upside role players that I think will contribute as rookies, even though they won't have overall dominant stat lines. But in terms of scoring potential, big play potential, and somebody who even in limited opportunities, even if they get two to three catches or maybe two to three carries in a game, they still could score on any one of those touches and still be a productive potential flex option as a rookie and somebody who you really want to hold on to in the future because I think their role can only grow from there. These are all really explosive playmakers and all guys who I think will be good players in the NFL, even though there might be a little bit of a slow start just based on the destinations they went to. But we're going to start off with Jaden Reed, who is the second round pick for the Packers out of Michigan State. And I'll be honest, by the way, uh, before I get into what Reed brings to the table, this was a little bit early for me taking him in the second round. In terms of how I had this receiving class stacked all together, there was a bunch of guys on the board that I felt I would have taken before him. But that being said, I do understand why they pulled the trigger there. They were going after a very specific skill set and role, and they felt that he was the best on the board at doing that, and they didn't want to risk losing him in the third. Again, a little bit early for me, but I also want to emphasize, totally understand why they did it, because now when you look at their 11 personnel packages, 
Keep in mind, this is an offense that is going to try to avoid 11 personnel as much as possible. They want to live in 12 personnel. They want to live in 21, 22, all these big bodies on the field, running the ball, play action, all that stuff. They want to protect Jordan Love by just running, 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 and not really making him have to survive in messy pockets in third and nine, right? But in the scenario where they are in third and nine and they have to go into 11 personnel, they did not want to have a slow slot receiver. They wanted legitimate gas that could threaten deep down the field. That is what Reed gives them, and that is why they took him in the second round. Because in the event where they have to go Christian Watson at X, Jaden Reed in the slot, and then Romeo Dubs as probably the Z receiver, they want to have three guys on the field with legitimate 4-4 or better speed so that they can just make the read as simple as possible for Jordan Love. They're going to be calling a lot of 989, which is one of my favorite pass concepts because it's literally just find the matchup and throw it deep. That is what they're going to do. And you can't really do it unless you have either really good speed all over the field or guys who are ridiculously dominant in jump ball situations. Small caveat to that, by the way, uh, when Jordan Love was coming out of college, one of the reasons why I didn't have him as a first round pick was because he wasn't good at throwing jump balls. In fact, boundary fades were his worst throw by far. Like he just couldn't place them. For whatever reason, he couldn't throw a back shoulder. He really struggled at leading guys up the field. You know, maybe he's fixed that by now, right? Because it's been actual years since he was at Utah State. It's been a long time. But I do think that giving him margin for error by just having a bunch of ridiculous speed demons outside is probably prudent because that wasn't a good throw for him in college. He just wasn't good at throwing fades. So now if you have these absolute burners outside and you're kind of scaring a defense into playing a too high safety structure, now you've got Reed who can also threaten the deep middle of the field himself and the safeties are kind of put into a bind, right? Like, do we want to cap over the top and play cover two because we don't trust our corners against Christian Watson and Romeo Dubs? And do we want to leave Reed alone on like either a third safety or a Mike linebacker and hope that he doesn't burn us down the middle? Or do we want to play a middle field close coverage and risk Christian Watson getting four steps on our corner, which at that point, you know, it doesn't matter how accurate Jordan Love is, Watson's probably going to house that thing. So they're kind of creating an interesting uh, speed element on this roster that just makes Jordan Love's deficiencies not matter as much. And I really respect that. And I get why they made the pick from that standpoint, because they're trying to cover for what their quarterback historically hasn't been great at by just making the fastest, most ridiculous receiving core possible, right? Now, that being said, like I mentioned, they're not going to be in 11 personnel that often. They're going to be mostly in two tight end looks or, you know, I guess technically a three tight end look, even though Dubois is a tight end, he's really more of an H back. It's more of a 22 personnel situation. Anyway, we're getting in the weeds. They're going to have a bunch of big bodies on the field. Jaden Reed is not going to be on the field that much, but when he is on the field, he is a legitimate deep threat who, even if he only gets two catches, it could go for 70 yards and a touchdown. And I think he's worth the pick from that standpoint. And to be perfectly honest, he could very easily beat out Romeo Dubs for that Z spot anyway and get a starting role by the end of his rookie year. So this is kind of a gamble on speed and a gamble on big playability and realizing that that's specifically why the Packers brought him in and the role that he is probably gonna play for them. And that still does have value from a fantasy perspective. As a rookie, he's probably gonna be more valuable in best ball than anything else, just because again, he could get three catches and have a monster day and carry you. So I do highly recommend you go after him in every single underdog league you draft because he's going to be valuable in best ball. That much I know for sure. But in terms of quote unquote, normal fantasy football, there will be some weeks where he's on your bench and he's putting up 15 points. Just be prepared for that. It's gonna happen. You got to live with it. And I think it's a pretty similar story for Puka Nakua as well, who was not a second round pick. He was actually a fifth round pick. But you could argue that he had day two talent. And the only reason why he slipped to the fifth round in the real draft was just because of durability issues. He got hurt a lot. He was banged up a lot. And his most productive season in college was 43 catches for 800 something yards. It was really frustrating, right? Because I feel like we never got to see a fully armed and operational Pukunakua, whether he was at Washington or BYU, and that's frustrating. But watching him on tape, you can understand why the Rams were really, really excited about getting him in the fifth round. 
And I think his role, just like Jaden Reed, even if he's not going to be fed a lot of targets and a lot of touches as a rookie, I think there will be some weeks where he's putting up 15, 16, 17 points because of his ability to score. Though, that being said, he's going to score in different ways than Reed. Reed obviously is like a T.Y. Hilton-ish deep threat who can take a post for 50 yards and score at will, whereas Nakua, I think, is going to get a lot of his scores in the red zone, not just as a receiver, where he's a great contested catcher, super physical, ball winner, all that kind of stuff, but as a runner, too. BYU really emphasized the fact that he is a very special runner with the ball in his hands. They used him on jet sweeps. I mean, he got like five rushing touchdowns last year on jet sweeps. And they also gave him a bunch of screen passes, which in that offense are basically just extended handoffs. And, you know, they give him the ball and said, Puka, go make people miss. And he did. He's just really, really good with the ball in his hands. And that's a role that this Rams offense has been missing since Robert Woods, uh, well, used to be there, right? You know, Robert Woods back in the day, he was the jet sweep guy. He was the receiver that they would give carries to as kind of like a change up in the run game. He was somebody who, especially in short yarded situations and low red zone situations, they would legitimately lean on him to score. Puka Nakua is going to be that for the Rams. Again, not saying he's going to get fed the ball in the receiving game like Bobby Trees did. He's not quite there yet as a receiver, but it's not like he's that far off either. Like I said earlier, he's got great ball skills. He can win one-on-one -on -one down the boundary. You can put him in the slot. You can put him outside. And even though he's not the best tester, I think when he has pads on and when the ball's in his hands, he actually just moves a lot faster. And there are some guys that are like that, right? Khalil Shakir at Boise State was the same way. He was literally two miles an hour faster once he had the ball versus, you know, when he was tracking a deep ball on a deep post. He was significantly slower when he was trying to go get a deep ball than when he just was taking a screen to the house. I can't really explain it. Some guys are just faster when people are chasing them. And Pukanuku was one of them. I want to reiterate here, I think his role as a rookie is going to be fairly limited, but it is a valuable role. I think he will get two or three rushing touchdowns because of that role. I think he's going to get somewhere between three to five receiving touchdowns. And you're going to look up in December and he's going to be one of the most productive rookies in terms of scoring touchdowns and converting in the red zone. And that's a really valuable thing. And I think his role is going to grow from there to eventually, again, not immediately, but eventually be a Robert Woods type of stat line. You know, something like 70 to 80 catches, 1,000 to 1,100 yards, hopefully four to six touchdowns, and then you throw in the rushing production on top of that, and he's going to end up with like 1,400 total yards and like nine touchdowns. That's really, really good. And that's the top end projection. I get it. And it's a wild projection for a fifth round pick. But I do think that's legitimately possible if he stays healthy. That is the only reason he went in the fifth round. It was durability, not talent, not role, not character, just durability. So I'm a big believer in Puka Nakua. That's why I have him in the tier three. You're probably going to get him in like the last round of your dynasty draft. In fact, I can almost guarantee that you will. And also in best ball, like in underdog, you're going to get him in the last round like I do in virtually every single draft. But it's going to be worth it. I really do believe it. It's going to be worth it. And that brings us to Marvin Mims with the Broncos, another young receiver who will have a limited role as a rookie, but who's explosive, and I mean really explosive playmaking potential, is maybe going to make him a viable flex starter even as early as this year. And by the way, I fully understand the trepidation in terms of investing in him this early, because looking at the depth chart, you know, Cortland Sutton's there, Tim Patrick's coming back from that ACL, and he was kind of a glue guy for this team before he got hurt. Uh, Jerry Judy is still there, you know, an ascending talent that people really like, not to mention KJ Hamler uh, and then Marquez Callaway. Like there's just a lot of receivers in Denver. That being said, I think that in terms of like the true deep threat role, right? Like the Devery Henderson role in this offense, which Sean Payton loves. He loves having that type of guy who's getting like 35 catches a year, but they all go for 30 plus yards. I think that Marvin Mims is better at that than KJ Hamler is. And I think that when they do go into 11 personnel and they have a speed threat on the field, it's going to be Marvin Mims and not KJ Hamler. I think he's a better route runner. I think he's got better hands. I think he's tougher. He's more physical. He can handle contact better. I just think he's a better player. And that's probably why they invested a second round pick in him, because if they thought that KJ Hamler could do that right now, they wouldn't have done that. 
Not to mention that, again, he has a different skill set than all of the receivers, quote unquote, ahead of him on the depth chart. Sutton is a very different type of player, as is Tim Patrick. Those are both kind of big body, you know, ball winners on fades outside types of guys. They're not really going to burn you deep. They're not somebody who's going to turn around a safety with a double move and go win on a deep post for 70 yards like Marvin Mims would. Jerry Judy can do that, obviously, but even he, I don't think, has the same vertical gas that Marvin Mims has. I think he's a little bit more of an intermediate threat, somebody who's going to convert like every single third down for you, but he doesn't have, you know, again, that Devery Henderson type of juice that I think Sean Payton really wants. Bottom line, you cannot survive in the AFC without having explosive playmakers that can get you chunks. Marvin Mims can get you chunks, and his playtime will be determined by the fact that he's one of the only guys on the team that can do that. And from there, we're going to round off Tier 3 by looking at Charlie Jones with the Bengals. He's the deep threat out of Purdue. Again, another guy who, as a rookie, will have a limited role, but has very, very high upside in the future. And I know this is going to sound weird. Please don't kill me for it. But he reminds me a lot of Jahan Dotson. And I mean Jahan Dotson in college, right? I'm not comparing him to somebody who maybe was the offensive rookie of the year last year, were it not for health. But looking at how Charlie Jones moved at Purdue versus how Jahan Dotson moved at Penn State, it's pretty darn similar. And I think that he has the physical potential to maybe eventually be what Jahan Dotson is for the Commanders. Again, just like Dotson, he's on the smaller side. He's a buck 75 at like 5'11 and a half, but he does have the same vertical juice. I'm talking three level juice, not just somebody who can stack on a quarter immediately, but somebody who can also pull away once he gets stacked. He's got great feet, great hips, very good route runner, super tough over the middle, like absolutely fearless over the middle. There were some hospital balls that he got thrown that I think most receivers would have just completely dropped on principle because they didn't want to get obliterated. And he hung on like he absolutely did not hesitate for a moment. And he took some vicious shots because of it. But he popped up every single time again, 175 pounds and still took that kind of contact and was OK. I was actually very surprised by that because most receivers that small, they kind of get beat up. And Charlie Jones, for whatever reason, just he took it. So looking at him long term, you know, I think he provides more vertical juice than Tyler Boyd, who's in the last year of his deal. And I think the fact that he does give you vertical ability outside means that you can keep putting Jamar Chase in the slot where he could just go beat up on smaller corners. You can put T in the slot as a big slot option and run fades with him from that kind of, you know, way reduced split where he's got more space to work with. And you're not going to lose any sort of vertical ability outside by putting your number three outside. Again, in terms of rookie potential, he's not going to be on the field that much because they have Jamar, they have T, they have Boyd. But this is a pick for 2024. I think he will be on the field a lot in 2024 as their future number three. And I think that he is an even more versatile player than Tyler Boyd, who himself has been very good for a very long time. As long as Joe Burrow is in Cincinnati, which he will be for the next, uh, I don't know, a lot of years, I'm really heavily investing in anybody that will be catching balls from him. And that's going to be Charlie Jones again, starting in 2024. And I'm willing to invest a pick in Dynasty this high in him for that potential. Keep in mind, there are a bunch of receivers in tier four that we're going to go over that will go ahead of him. Trust me, Charlie Jones is the one you want to target. In terms of skill set, in terms of role, in terms of situation, there's not a whole lot better in this class, folks. Like he checks a lot of boxes and I'm going to be investing in him pretty heavily in every single dynasty league that I'm in. I think I might have mentioned it before. Uh, maybe I didn't that I actually did take Charlie Jones in my own dynasty draft last week. I missed out on Puka by one pick because I'm an idiot and tweeted about him like two hours before the draft and then I got sniped, which sucks. But you know, Charlie, again, still a great investment for the future. Very excited about him. I just really wanted Puka. But anyway, tier four also has a lot of really good kind of future investments, you know, that maybe in 2023 aren't gonna be incredibly impactful, but especially in 2024 and beyond, I think they have a very large role or at least potentially a very large role. And I'm very excited about all these guys as well. So with that said, Let's get to tier four. This tier has a lot of really good football players in it, some of which fell pretty deep into the real draft, and I kind of didn't expect that. 
A.T. Perry went in the sixth round. Parker Washington, I think, went in the sixth round, if I recall correctly. Demario Douglas slipped a little bit later than I thought he would. And they're all really good receivers, but we're going to get to them in a second. First things first, I want to talk about Tank Dell in Houston. And I want to make this crystal clear. My reservations about Tank Dell are not about him as a receiver. He's an excellent route runner. I mean, damn near impossible to cover in space. He is incredibly quick. He has a lot of nuance as a route runner as well, which when packaged with his short area burst and his just obscene stop start ability, he's just almost impossible for any DB to stay with in space. It's really, really special stuff. Plus, statistically speaking, he was one of the most effective red zone receivers this year in all of college football, despite his size. He's a great tracker of the deep ball. I mean, you can line him up inside, you can line him up outside. There's not really a whole lot he can't do as a receiver. However, my trepidation about him from the very beginning was not about his skill set as a receiver, wasn't about anything that he did on the field. It was about the fact that he's 166 pounds. That scares the absolute shit out of me because it's very rare. I'm talking going all the way back like 30, 40 years. If you look at every receiver in the NFL, it is very rare that someone that size survives a long time in the league. If you look at his spider chart from Mock Draftable or Mock Draft Table, I'm not really sure how they pronounce it, but they go back and they look at every single receiver that went through the combine in the last two plus decades. And Tank Dell has a first percentile weight. That's really bad. That means he's in the bottom 1% of all receiving prospects at 165 pounds at the combine. If I recall correctly, he's 166 as a pro day. He's in the third percentile for height at 5'8 and 3 eighths, And he's in the sixth percentile at hand size at 8 and 5 eighths inches. Even his arm length is only 14th percentile. So he is just straight up tiny. And with somebody at his size, again, my concern is not about how he runs routes and how he catches the ball and how effective he is as a receiver. My concern is that if he runs over the middle and he gets hit by a 240 pound linebacker coming full speed, is he gonna be okay? Like, I just don't know if he can hold up against contact for 17 weeks of the regular season. That's more games than he ever had to play in college at that weight. And he's playing against bigger, faster, stronger players who, quite frankly, hit a lot harder than he had to deal with at Houston. He would be a historical outlier in almost every sense of the word if he was able to put together a really productive career at that size. Hopefully he can get up to like 172 to 175. But again, we're asking him to put on 10 pounds just to get to the low end of the threshold of what's acceptable. He is so far outside the norm that I just can't justify putting him any higher than tier four. It's not that I don't love him as a receiver. It's not that I don't love his skill set. It's that I don't know if he can hold up. That is literally it. And if he does put on weight and he does hold up and he, he can go through 17 games every single year and be fine, that's awesome. I would love that for the kid because he's a great receiver. But until I see it, I just can't be confident that that's exactly what's going to go down here. So I'm just going to be cautious. I'm putting him in tier four as a result of that. And I'm also being really cautious about Michael Wilson as well, who went in the third round to the Cardinals. I think Michael Wilson, the prospect, is really intriguing because, again, on tape, you see a very high-level receiver. He absolutely lit up the senior bowl. He's got size. He's got burst. He could track the deep ball really well when he's actually given a chance. And, you know, even as a route runner, maybe some people kind of overstate how good of a route runner he is, but he's still good. I don't think that he's an elite route runner, maybe like some people have portrayed it just based on Senior Bowl one-on-ones. You watch him on tape, and I think there are some things he can still clean up. But I wouldn't say that he's raw. I do think that he's good, but there is a little bit more room to grow there. But overall, again, from a tape grade standpoint, he absolutely is worth a third-round pick, at least in the real draft. And also, from a tape grade perspective, he probably should be in the Tier 3 of my Dynasty receivers. However durability is a concern. That's why I have him in tier four. He gets hurt or at least got hurt a lot. And again, the NFL season is longer and you're playing against bigger, faster, stronger athletes on defense. I'm just not 100% sure based on his history that he's going to hold up in the pros. He's a great player. I have almost no complaints about him as a receiver. I'm just being very cautious about it because if he's not on the field, I'm not going to get points from him anyway, right? So this is where we kind of have to dissociate real football from fantasy football and just recognize that sometimes good players just get hurt a lot. And I think he's at least historically been one of those good players that just gets hurt a lot. And it's really, really frustrating. I hope he stays healthy in the pros, but 
I'm not going to overdraft him on that hope. Next up, we have Cedric Tillman, who again, SEC receiver, can't show the film. Um, but I'm absolutely fascinated by Tillman as a prospect. And especially when it comes to dynasty, I'm fascinated because I don't really know what to make of his situation. He's very talented. He's another one of these big body, fast receivers that you would expect to be a legitimate vertical threat as like a true X receiver. That being said, he's in Cleveland where there's literally 16 receivers on the roster right now. I don't know what to make of this depth chart. You've got Amari Cooper, uh, DPJ, and Elijah Moore as your top three. They just took David Bell last year to kind of be like the new Jarvis Landry for them as like a big slot. And he's a contrasting style to Elijah Moore, who's a smaller, faster slot. They still got Marquise Goodwin. Even at his age, he's still got legitimate juice as a deep threat. Then you got Tillman, obviously, as like the backup, backup X receiver, because DPJ is already the backup X receiver, and they just put him at Z. But if Amari goes down, DPJ is going to be the X, and then I maybe Tillman goes on the field as a Z. I don't really know. There's just a lot of guys. I mean, Jakeem Grant is still there. Anthony Schwartz, who hasn't really given them anything, but he's still on the roster. Uh, Jalen Darden they got from Tampa. Isaiah Weston, again, another guy who's like 6'3", 6'4", with 4'3 speed. There's just a lot of guys on this depth chart, and I don't know what role to project for Tillman, not just now, but also in the future. Like, I have to imagine that some of these guys are going to be long-term players for them, and I just don't really know where he fits in. As a talent, I love his talent. Again, he's big, he's fast, he broke a lot of press coverage in the SEC. They put him on the line of scrimmage a lot more than they put Jalen Hyatt on the line of scrimmage, and I felt that he was very adept at breaking press coverage because he's just bigger, faster, and stronger than everybody, even SEC DBs. I think his contested catch percentage was you know similar to Mingo in the sense that it was very deflated by some pretty errant deep balls uh, from Hendon Hooker. Not gonna lie, charting all the uh, deep contested targets to Cedric Tillman made me lower Hendon Hooker a little bit in my quarterback rankings. And I actually, I, I kind of fell a little bit out of love with his deep ball ability because there were some pretty ugly ones to Cedric Tillman that didn't give him a realistic shot of catching them. And yet they went against Tillman's contested catch percentage where I'm like, nobody's catching that shit. It hit the DB in the back. So, you know, I, I feel like he's a better contested catcher than maybe the numbers suggest. Not that he's elite at it. You know, he's not like Josh Downs, who has legitimately 70% contested catch rate. But he's better than the mid-30s or whatever he happened to be on, on when I checked the numbers. So overall, we got a big, fast, very talented receiver that theoretically has a good quarterback situation if Deshaun Watson ever gets back to being what he was before. And who knows if he will. I got nothing for that. But he's still going to be there for a while regardless, right? Because the contract is fucking stupid. But anyway, Tillman is talented. He's in a weird situation. Not a bad situation, but just a weird one. And that's why I have him down in tier four because I just don't know how to project it. I really don't. If you want to take him in like the third or fourth round of your 12-team dynasty draft, go for it. The upside is worth it, but you just have to be aware that at least in 2023 and maybe even in 2024, he might not be on the field that much, and you're just going to have to deal with that. Next up, we have A.T. Perry, fresh new Saints receiver out of Wake Forest who went a lot later than I anticipated, like I mentioned before. I thought he very easily could have gone on day two, and he ended up going in round six, so I do wonder if there's a medical thing I just didn't know about because I know that he interviewed really well. Like he absolutely smashed all of his interviews. He's a good athlete. He's got legit high four, four, low four, five-ish type speed. He's got size, he's got fluidity, runs a full route tree. There's a lot to love about A.T. Perry and I think he's legitimately a great receiver prospect. So there must be something I don't know about for why he fell to the sixth round and I'll have to check in on that, but I don't have the answer for that right now. When looking at the Saints receiving core, I think this is actually a pretty advantageous spot for A.T. Perry to go because they could still use another guy with his skill set. Again, he's a bigger receiver with speed that can play either inside or outside if you want him to be a big slot or if you want him to be an X. He can do either or. And so depending on where they want to play Michael Thomas, again, we're not entirely sure if Michael Thomas is still Michael Thomas. You know, maybe they still want him to be that big slot. Maybe they want him to be outside. I think Chris Olave will primarily still be outside because he is so damn good there. And Rashid Shahid, I think that he's probably more of a slot for them than somebody who would play outside. So 
I'm not entirely sure where A.T. Perry is going to play for them, but the fact that he can play any of these spots means that he's flexible enough and versatile enough that he's going to get significant snaps even as a rookie. The one thing that I really want him to clean up now that he's in the NFL is drops. There were a lot of concentration drops, especially, oddly enough, on curl routes. There's something about when he would turn back to the quarterback and the ball would be outside his frame. He just struggled there, and I'm not really sure why. It was just very odd, right? You know, considering how attentive to detail he is as a player. And again, I interviewed him before the draft, and I got to talk football with him. And he does approach the game like a veteran. But there's just something about curl routes where he just, the, the ball would not stick to his hands. I don't know. He's going to have to hit the jugs machine and fix that. But other than that, there's not really any major flaws to his game. Like I said, very nuanced route runner with size and speed and flexibility in terms of alignment. He's going to get on the field. The reason why I have him down in tier four is just because I don't think he's ever going to be the number one there as long as Chris Olave is there. And as long as Michael Thomas is there, if he's back to what he was before, he might not even ever be the number two. He might just be stuck in number three receiver land, which is not great for fantasy purposes. So until that situation kind of shakes itself out, I don't really know what to do with A.T. Perry. I just know he's a good player that theoretically, uh, you know, has a pretty good quarterback situation, too. That now brings us to Demario Douglas with the Patriots, who also I saw down at Shrine Bowl and got to talk to him a little bit and interview him. Great kid, super humble, really hard worker, and an absolute perfect fit for this Patriots offense. Bill O'Brien actually got hired slashed announced as the new Patriots OC the week that the Shrine Bowl happened. And he basically just stepped off the plane in Vegas and there's like a little airport next to the practice field. He stepped off the plane, came to practice and immediately started running gauntlet drills, which might have been the most Bill O'Brien thing I've ever seen. Just no rest, no time for breaks. Just go straight from the airport and go coach a football practice. And he spent a lot of time with Demario Douglas that week. They were intensely zeroing in on him as a potential mid day three slot receiver. And I was not shocked at all when they drafted him. They spent that entire week down in Vegas, basically just installing the offense with him. So he's already familiar with, you know, play terminology and all the different positions and alignments and what they call different motions and huddle procedure. He already knows what he's doing. And I think the fact that he didn't play in the Shrine Bowl, even though he was on the Patriots staff, I feel like they kind of saw everything they needed to see with him. And they're like, look, dude, you don't have to be on the field for the game. We like you already. You've made your point. So I think that this pick did not shock me at all. He's great for them. He's immediately going to be a contributor in the slot. All the different choice routes that they typically have their slot receivers do. He's incredible at that because he's got great feet. He's super explosive in short areas. He's got ball skills. He's tough. He runs every single route in the book. He's just a classic Patriots receiver. There's really no other way to describe it. I think in terms of best fit, in terms of skill set for team, this is one of the best in this entire draft class at any position. I could not possibly think of a better destination for him. And I could say the same thing about Parker Washington as well, who's another receiver that somehow slipped to the sixth round, and I don't really know how that happened. I thought Washington very easily could have been one of the first 10 receivers taken. Obviously, he wasn't. Again, not really sure what happened there, but just looking at his skill set, I think he is absolutely perfect for the Jags and everything that they love out of their slot receivers. Even though he is on the shorter side at 5'10", he is super rocked up at about 205. So again, he's about 40 pounds heavier than Tank Dell, which is uh, kind of insane when you think about it. So he's got tons of body armor. He can absolutely survive over the middle. He is extremely tough into contact. He catches everything. Like he's got some of the best ball skills in this entire class, especially through contact. And I feel like his size and physicality also is what helps make him a really good yards after catch threat too. It's not just about quickness and speed. It's about the fact that he can legitimately break tackles in space just because he's friggin' strong and he's really low to the ground. He's got a great center of gravity. He's built like a running back who just happens to play wide receiver. If I was trying to figure out a comp for him in terms of play style and the best ways to use him, Honestly, it's the exact same as Christian Kirk and how the Jaguars used him last year. 
you know, again, he's got great ball skills, so you can run him on those deep crosses and he's able to track it down the field and make really tough catches. You can give him screens. I mean, he's absolutely fearless, like I said, over the middle. So if they're playing outside leverage on him and he's got to run those choice routes over the middle and just take a hit from a linebacker, he has no problems doing that. And overall, again, just kind of looking at him as like a copy paste of Christian Kirk, even though Kirk is going to be there for another two years, if not longer, if Kirk happens to go down, Parker Washington's going to slide into that role and immediately be a starting caliber receiver when it comes to, you know, fantasy, right? I don't think he's going to start in Jacksonville this year or maybe even next year when it comes to real football because Calvin Ridley's still there, Zay Jones, obviously Kirk is still there. That's a tough lineup to crack in terms of being one of the top three guys on the roster. But if one of them goes down, Washington will get probably all of their snaps. He is worth rostering in Dynasty just for that, let alone the fact that by 2025, when it becomes very advantageous, I should say, from a uh, cap point of view to move on from Christian Kirk, they just have another Christian Kirk waiting in the wings, and he's going to be that type of guy for them. Long term, we love Trevor Lawrence as a quarterback, so I have no concerns about who's throwing him the ball. Dougie P's offense is also great for slot receivers. So again, when looking at Dynasty, this is not necessarily a pick for 2023 unless somebody gets hurt. It's more of a pick for 2025 and beyond, but that's what Dynasty's for, right? You're making plans for the future, you're identifying talent, and you're looking at players who can fill a role with their skill set. That is going to be Parker Washington eventually. It just might take a little while, but you got to have faith in it. Now, from there, we're just going to go straight into the next batch of receivers in Tier 5 and then in Tier 6. I'm not going to spend too much time on these last two tiers because I think the difference between real football value and fantasy football value is going to be stark in these groups. A lot of these guys are probably going to end up as like wide receiver four on their own team and be valuable contributors when we're talking about, you know, actual football here. A lot of them are either complimentary deep threats or special teamers or, you know, maybe guys that you can rely on in the red zone, somebody who can work the middle because they're really tough and have good hands, you know, looking at you, Xavier Hutchinson. I think that they're all going to be really good role players, but I don't necessarily think that they have uh, you know, necessarily the top end ceiling of, say, the role players like Jaden Reed and Marvin Mims and Charlie Jones, who I think can grow into more than that. Doesn't mean that they're not great players. It just means that I see more of a narrow role and a, a slightly higher ceiling on them that might restrict their fantasy value not really their real football value, if that makes sense. For instance, with Tyler Scott, Darius Davis, and Jalen Moreno Cropper, and to a degree also Trey Palmer as well, I see them as really nice complimentary deep threats that are probably gonna be wide receiver four on say the Bears, the Chargers, the Cowboys, and the Buccaneers respectively. They're gonna get plenty of snaps and they're probably mostly gonna play Z just because of all their size. Tyler Scott in particular, he's not a big guy and Temple beat the absolute shit out of him in press coverage. So he's gonna have to play Z, which works out just fine because in Chicago, you got DJ Moore being the X, so he doesn't have to take any snaps at X. But again, limited skill set, limited role. There's only certain things he can do. You know, Jalen Cropper, again, not the biggest guy in the world. I think he's better at breaking press than Tyler Scott, even though Scott, I think, has better ball skills deep down the field. But Cropper himself, again, good player, but a little bit more narrow of a role in that Dallas receiving core. And I think that, you know, a lot of his big play opportunities might not even be in the receiving game. I think that he might be, uh, you know, their jet sweep guy, a la Puka Nakua, uh, just not quite as big. Cropper, for instance, is 172 pounds and Nakua is 201. So there's almost a 30 pound difference there. They're going to be used differently. Darius Davis is even smaller than Cropper. He's in the 160s. And again, you can use him on jet sweeps just like Cropper. I mean, they're both really fast. They get the edge. They get explosives and stuff like that. But there's there's only so much you can do at that size. And it's it's hard. It really is hard when you're under 170 pounds to get a consistent amount of touches. I talked about it with Tank Dell earlier. It is a very rare size profile that works in the NFL. Or rather, I should say it's rare if it works. That's why, you know, gun to my head, if I had to choose between Cropper and, and Darius Davis, 
I might actually lean Cropper there just because he's a little bit bigger. Not that much bigger, but big enough that I at least have more faith in it working out as him being a wide receiver four on the Cowboys that sticks around and is a big play threat and you know maybe does something for you. But even then, we're talking about a lot of guys in tier five here who are good football players, but maybe not good fantasy options. So if I'm just doing a dynasty draft here, there's a bunch of names earlier on the list that I'm prioritizing for one reason or another, just because I think that from a consistency or even just from a ceiling perspective, they probably have a higher chance of hitting. Now, that being said, I do want to bring one thing up because I have Rasheed Rice in this tier as well, who is a bigger guy and who did get pretty early draft capital invested into him. You know, the Chiefs spent a second round pick on him. And full disclosure, I have a lot of receivers that either went really late on day three or even undrafted that I had a higher grade on than Rasheed Rice. Like Jalen Cropper, he went undrafted. He was a UDFA for the Cowboys and I had a higher grade on him overall than I did on Rice. I just have a fundamental disagreement with the Chiefs front office about his valuation. And I'm sure there's something that I missed. You know, they got to interview him. They got to work him out. They did the medicals. There's got to be something there that I'm not aware of. But if we're just going on tape grade, which is all that I have available to me for the most part, there is absolutely no way that Rasheed Rice was a second round pick. Like, absolutely no way. And I get it. He was playing through an injury and to a degree, maybe that slowed him down. But even when he was healthy, like I went back and, and I made sure that I could watch games when he was healthy, he still looked like he was running in wet cement to me. I just don't get it. You know, he went to the Senior Bowl and struggled, couldn't get open. His contested catch rate is way low, like not a ball winner in the air, really struggles to get separation, really struggles to beat press coverage. I just don't get it, man. I really don't get it. Like I I had a better grade on Tyler Scott, on Xavier Hutchinson, on Cropper, like I mentioned, uh, like even Romigio, like, it, you know, gun to my head. Who am I taking? The guy who I know is going to contribute on special teams as a, a punt and kick returner and also be a good slot receiver or Rasheed Rice. I probably would have gone with Romigio in terms of who's going to make an impact on my team. I would have been more inclined to say him. And, and I know I have a wildly different view on him than the Chiefs front office does. That is clear. One of us is right and one of us is wrong. And I'm probably wrong because they must know something that I don't. But that being said, based on my tape grade, I can't in good conscience move him that far up the board just because the Chiefs spent a second round pick on him. Like that that does not compute to me. So I'll let somebody else have him. If he works out for him, great. If I look like an idiot, fine. I look like an idiot all the time. But if I'm gonna go down swinging, I'm at least gonna use my own bat. That's a phrase that I use often and I will stick by it, right or wrong. And from there, we're going to round this off with tier six. Again, we got Grant DeBose, who went to the Packers, Trey Tucker, who's a Raider, Ronnie Bell with the 49ers, Andre Yoshevis. God, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Normally when I I grade guys, it's just off all 22, so I don't really get pronunciations because I don't watch the broadcast angle, but I think I got that right. If I fucked it up, please let me know in the comments below. And then we got Dontavion Wicks, who also went to the Packers, and Justin Shorter, who went to the Bills. And just like tier five, all these guys, I think, are probably going to be practice squad guys or, you know, maybe wide receiver five types. But I don't see them getting significant snaps as rookies. And I don't really see them as lottery tickets that I'm heavily investing in, you know, way down the board in the draft. If somebody else takes them, totally fine. Uh, I have a bunch of other targets that I would rather go after first. And to be honest, if your rookie draft is so damn long that you're taking somebody like Andre Yoshevis in like the last round, you probably have too many picks. Not going to lie. You have a lot of picks and you should probably trade them for some guys who start because I don't think that he will. In fact, I find it highly unlikely that he ever will. But anyway, I still wanted to put tier six up here just so that you could see it. You know, I think we went like 32, 33 names deep at receiver here. Most of them are not going to be fantasy relevant, at least as rookies. You know, a lot of them might be fantasy relevant within two to three years. In terms of guys that I feel comfortable starting on my fantasy team in year one, it's probably like seven of them. And then there's a whole pack of guys that by 2024, I'm going to feel good about as well. 
But in terms of long-term dynasty potential, I would say after tier four, I'm kind of tapping out and I'm going to hit other positions. That's just my personal take on it, at least. Before we wrap things up today, if you want to, for lack of a better word, weaponize any of the information that you got here today, or you know, really just take advantage of the fact that most fantasy players have no idea who half these names even are. They haven't even done any of their summer research yet. They haven't looked at depth charts and they probably haven't even looked at highlights, let alone tape. If you want to take advantage of the head start that this episode hopefully gave you, the best way to do that is going to be on Underdog Fantasy, specifically with best ball drafts. And they just started Best Ball Mania 4 like less than a month ago at this point which is $15 million in prizes, by the way. It is the biggest best ball tournament ever by far, like 50% bigger than last year. And last year's was the biggest ever. They went from 10 million to 15 million. So it's fucking huge. And historically, if you look back at the data in the last three years of them doing this, a lot of the best teams that went on to win best ball mania are drafted in the summer because that's when you're going to get the best values, especially on young players that are either rookies or in their second, maybe third year at most, right? Because these are players that, again, a lot of people haven't studied or they're being cautious about because they haven't seen them play in the NFL yet. Or in some cases for the second and third year guys, they're just now coming into the role that they were drafted to play. So if you were planning on getting in on any best ball tournaments this year, obviously Best Ball Mania 4 is the biggest one and the one that will pay out the most by a lot. And I think the best time to draft is going to be any time in the summer, whether it's now all the way straight through to probably early July is where ADPs start shifting and you start getting less value. So if you're going to do it, do it now. And if you did already decide that you were going to play this year and try to go for that multi-million dollar prize or really do anything else on Underdog, whether it's weekly pickums or anything for any other sport, whether it's NBA, hockey, baseball, they even have esports. There's a whole bunch of different stuff you can do in Underdog. So if you already decided you were going to play, I do have a promo code and that is promo code Brett and that will match your first deposit up to $100 which would then give you a free extra four entries into Best Ball Mania 4 if that's what you want to do with it. So in total, if you can get eight lineups into Best Ball Mania 4, again, it is a massive prize pool that increases your odds of winning and also increases your odds of just having a really good team in general. So uh, yeah, thank you to Underdog for sponsoring this show and this series and this channel in general. I look forward to another very, very active Best Ball season this summer. And with that, I'll be back very soon with something else entirely. And uh, I haven't decided what that is yet, but when I launch it, I'll see you then.